Hello, everyone, and welcome into another episode of the Big Blue News Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Beesmore, and of course, we've got the co-host, Nolan Fleming. But today, we've got a guest with us, right, Nolan? Yeah, so I've heard. Uh, got Isaac Punts with us, uh, or Isaac Parks, whatever you want to call him. Uh, <laughs> Isaac, what's up? Yeah. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me on. Ready to talk about some good, good things in Kentucky. Yeah, a little bit about, though. About Isaac, he has a YouTube channel, of course. Uh, his name is Isaac Parks, but obviously on YouTube, he goes by Isaac Punts. And we're going to talk about Kentucky football, mainly the special teams. But how have you been doing, Isaac? Man, I'm doing great. Football season's officially underway. NFL preseason's happening right now. So we get to see a lot of uh, special teams, goofs and gaffs, lots of muff punts, lots of mishandled snaps. So some stuff we're going to talk about today as it pertains to Kentucky, unfortunately. But but we're going to hopefully uh, address those with some a, a twinge of optimism and and uh, light at the end of the tunnel-ness. So. Whatever, whatever little there may be, because, Chris, you dropped a bomb on the last podcast that was really negative, saying that the that they still needed work. So, you know, yeah. maybe Isaac is the – maybe maybe Isaac will provide us with the light. Yeah. Whereas, Mark- we're, we're, the, we're the Kentucky podcast, and we're the ones being down on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw the Mark Stoops quote that I posted, but uh, he basically said that the special teams has improved compared to last year, but they aren't where they are at. They aren't where UK is wanting to be at currently. Right. Well, I mean, UK has a pretty high standard for special teams, right? Like notoriously pretty good, I believe. I hope I don't get this wrong. I believe Ray Guy Award winner Max Duffy was a UK uh, UK punter. Mm -hmm. That's that's not a little mountain to jump over. So the standard is the standard, as we like to say in the specialist industry. So if you want to beat the you want to be the best guy the school has ever had. So if your best guy is one of the best guys to have done it, you know, obviously people are going to have some pretty high expectations going there. So that's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. Um, could you talk about what UK can do? to improve compared to last year. I mean, last year we've had, we had so many botched snaps, you know, missed field goals, and then obviously Colin Goodfellow getting in. Praise Colin Goodfellow. Praise him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So first of all, the Colin Goodfellow play, I I made a video on that. That man, he took that like a champ. There's like only (laughs) one, one way, like nine punters, no, 99 punters out of 100. They look at that ball rolling and they say, I'm going to fall on it. Let's let the defense make a play. That legend, that goat, he said, you know what? <laughs> Who needs an ACL anyway? I've got a second one. Wraps oh, yeah. his leg around the guy to get that ball off. Draws the flag. Like, you you live for heroic memories like that. That is that is the the punting equivalent of, like, diving on a live grenade to save your squadron. That was – it's <laughs> it sucks that it happened, right? Like, nobody I, – I would never wish that upon my worst enemy. But the fact that it happened, the fact that he made those decisions is beautiful. But – Addressing things like uh, making field goals, addressing things like the snap and making sure that our snaps are where they need to be. Um, a lot of that has to do with how many reps are these snappers getting at practice, making sure that our operations are good. And my opinion is you've got to be bolstering these guys to the point where they feel so confident getting them so many reps. Like I know I've seen snappers take just unfathomable amounts of reps like 150 200 snaps a day just to make sure that when they come to game time there's no mistakes like long snapping is one of those things where a single snap is uh arguably it's not very hard to do right and i think we all understand that a single snap is not particularly hard it's not it kind of gets joked on for being the easiest position in sports yeah. um <laughs> And we can all agree that it's a single one's not hard, but the the level that we hold them to and the fact that we make them do it perfectly every single time because it's easy, that's where the hardness comes in. So making sure that they work out those kinks, it comes down to whatever their practice regimen looks like. So a new energized, invigorated special teams coach can come in and and really dissect what's going on in practice. Because I think everything that you see on Saturday or Thursday, sometimes Friday, if you're in... <laughs> <laughs> uh if you're in what's that uh if you're in the maction any day of the week yeah, it can happen yeah that's whenever like, they do like wednesdays and tuesdays over there they're crazy yeah <laughs> yeah so whatever day that they're you're playing football that is a result of what happens on all the other days prior so if you're seeing some adverse snaps 
there might be a, a discussion that has to be had about how hard are we pushing our snappers? How much are we making them compete? How much are we making them fight for their job every single day? Mm -hmm. So once you have those discussions, and I'm sure a new special teams coordinator who would like to keep his job will have those discussions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully he gets that stuff uh, wrapped up, but it's really hard to diagnose from the outside looking in, obviously from a technical issue. Um, if a snap goes over a punter's head, typically a, the long snapper's butt gets a little high, a little too elevated. It causes a weird launch angle because usually they just want to slide back with a slight elevation. That back will set it. So like right now, they're down like this. This is their back. They'll push up, and then that sets the angle. So if they get too high, it sets a really high angle. All of a sudden, air mail, and uh, we got to go make a play as a punter or as a holder. So getting that's like the real nitty gritty technical issue that happened right there, but gets a little high, slings it. Um, so just kind of keeping that butt down, but hopefully they're getting all those kinks worked out uh, in practice. Yeah, and I don't know if you know anything about Jay Bowler, Kentucky added him. He's the new uh, running back slash special teams coach. Mm. He took over for John Settle. John Settle got fired last year. He was the running backs coach and also mm. helped out with the special teams, but didn't really like do anything necessarily. Yeah. And that makes me want to ask. Uh, there was a whole thing last year, obviously, at the end of the year, because let's be honest, special teams was a killer. But um, there was a whole thing last year about the fact that we didn't actually have a special teams coach, technically. We didn't have, like, one guy who was, like, just special teams. I, like, I'm personally of the belief at the moment that that's probably what we should do. Mm -hmm. And now I know we'll have to see uh, what happens this year with uh, Jay Bolware. I'm I'm sure it'll be better somehow because anything is better than what happened last year. It's like comparing which kid that I don't know eats crap or something has the best haircut. Yeah. You know, it, it's right. just like yeah. it's not the same. It, it's 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 weird. But I was just wondering if you think that maybe Kentucky does need just a special teams only coach. Yeah, I mean. The, the problem, I guess, with like where FBS is at right now is, as you guys might know, they're only allowed to have a certain number of coaches on staff. Right. So you kind of have to divvy up what's important. I personally, my personal belief, of course, I'm a special teams YouTuber. <laughs> I'm going to believe that special teams is a third of the game. You not having a designated coordinator to handle a third of the game seems like an oversight. And maybe it was that this guy who was supposed to be coordinating it last year just didn't, didn't pay it enough attention. So hopefully this new guy, like, it could be the same title, but it depends on how he's attacking that situation. So if he's coming in, he's saying, I'm going to get done what I need to get done with the running backs. But then I'm also going to have a whole chunk of my day dedicated to drawing up the best special teams game plan and preparing my specialists, my special teams units, uh, getting my depth charts ready so I have the best 11 guys available to go out there and attack it. Mm -hmm. I think you could easily, uh, well, easy as maybe not the right word but you can definitely right. do it you can definitely give it the attention that you need obviously i think they need to have somebody who takes that very very seriously mm -hmm. because special teams hands down will win you or lose you on average two to three games a year like there's there will always be two to three games where you'll look back and you'll go offenses and defenses were closely matched but at, you dang it they got this one big kick return their kicker made a, a big 52-yard field goal. Um, our guys missed a big field goal. We shanked a punt to give them good field position. Everything else was pretty close. We matched them for yards, but one or two plays on special teams were the big chunk factors that made us lose it. So if he's taking it seriously and he's you know improving it from last year, you should definitely see it in the wins and losses column, assuming all other variables stay consistent. Yeah, and last year, you're not wrong, two to three games, UK could have potentially won. I know for sure yep. one game was against Ole Miss. And yeah, that, that would have that was a killer. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, even Georgia, uh, that game could have been in play at least uh, yeah. if that one kick goes through. That game would have been – that would have been different. Yeah. There's a few. I mean, heck, there's there might even be more than three. There might <laughs> actually be like a really large number. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's – when you when you really start breaking it down, a lot of people don't think about it because – it's three or four plays a game. All right, well, the key ones, right, the ones that don't balance out are three or four plays a game. Mm -hmm. But those three or four plays suddenly turn into three to six points taken off the board if you're missing field goals. Those two to three bad punts that you got is potentially, like, the difference, everybody kind of just shrugs their shoulders at, like, a little 35-yard punt. But 
you know, it's the difference is if you hit a good one and it goes 55 yards, the offense is starting 20 yards back. How many times have these guys, you know, do teams barely get into field goal range and then get those three points, you know, mm. um, it, it compounds. So there's like a lot of different ways that uh, coaching staffs track it through like hidden yardage, figuring out how much better they did on special teams than us. It doesn't always show up in the stats book, but uh, when it really plays out throughout the year and you go back and you analyze it, special teams is a wildly important role. That's why you never hear like coaches uh, downplay it and be like, ah, oh, they're just a bunch of punters, a bunch of kickers, you know, not really important. They're just standing around with their thumbs in their butts, not doing anything. Like they, <laughs> they take it very seriously because they feel it the most. Like the head coach feels it when the punter drops one uh, inside the five and now they've got to dig themselves out of a hole and their punter turns right back around and doesn't even get it past the 50. And Mark Stoops talked a little bit about core phases in special teams. He says there are four with kickoff, kickoff return, punt, and punt returns. But I didn't know if you thought there were any more core phases into special special teams at all. No, those ones are really your bread and butter. Like mm -hmm. the the yardage on those, when you just think about how much yards those really account for, a lot of times teams will have – more kick return yards than uh, I don't want to say more kick return yards than offensive yards. If you're getting blown out, you'll probably have more kick return yards than offensive yards because <laughs> they're kicking it to you a lot and you're running yeah. back a lot. Um, but those yards are very important. Like I've, I've seen guys really make up for a lot of those yards. So it's one, once again, I'm taking back to this. It's very hard to see because we've gotten to a point where a lot of times kickers and punters are we're really we've gotten really good at it and i think a lot of people take it for granted that we are at a point right now where your average college kicker and punter is putting up numbers that would have made him a beast in the nfl like 10 years ago mm -hmm. um like the top 10 guys in the in, in college last year if you put them in those exact same stats and numbers if you put them in like the nfl in i don't know uh 2009 they're like the 10 best nfl players it's <laughs> it's unreal you know what i'm saying so like we've gotten really good so a lot of times it balances out so you really feel it on those four specifically like uh when you're not getting those yards back when you guys are taking you're taking a kickoff out at the five and you get tackled at the 15 and then they then you kick one and it's three deep you think you're about to beat them there and they take it out to the 28 29 30 and now you're like dang we are just getting hosed like they they starting with so much room now their punters not back you know not backed up your punter starting with his heels in the end zone it changes how you have to call the plays mm -hmm. you can't take a big sack when you're on your 10 yard line you know what i'm saying no. that now we're in safety territory <laughs> on your 30 you like you get hit you kind of go okay we're going to go to our ease the pain where we're going to get try to get back to the original first down marker and then let's just punt it and go play the field position game when you're backed up you're like oh my gosh they're gonna bring like <laughs> they're gonna bring so much pressure if we get a, a, a low snap he's gonna kick it off you know one of our guy the back of our guy's head like there's so much that, that just changes the game when you're losing the special teams battle that people won't appreciate or take notice of mm -hmm. right yeah and could you also talk about the mechanics that go into a field goal you know with the long snap or snap in the hole yeah. and then obviously the kick yeah, so the basic mechanics of it, I guess, and what makes it, it's a very precise function. So it starts with the operation time. So everything that I'm about to say, you know, has to has to operate, I would say, in average in about 1.3 seconds. So pretty quick when you think about it. And during that time, the snapper, try to think, so he'll snap, usually a right-handed snapper is going to have laces down. So he's he's going to throw the ball, and his premise is he's going to try to make it rotate three and a half times so the laces come straight back so then the punter can catch it and place it down and put it right on the kicker spot and in that time the snap is usually about 0.6 seconds i want to say maybe because they take a little heat off of it so maybe 0.4 maybe 0.5 but somewhere in that range in that time the kicker has those other 0 0.6 0 0.7 seconds mm. to have made contact with the ball so it's very quick not a lot of margin for error on anything so as any single one of those starts to deviate right the harder it becomes to complete the end task of putting the ball through the uprights like the big yellow things down the field we got to split them and not can't really we don't have a lot of error that direction either it's not 
uprights look really big when you're in the stands, but like when you're all of a sudden when you're 40 yards away, you're like, ha, you know, they're, <laughs> all of a sudden they're looking kind of small. And um, so like the snap comes in a little high. A lot of guys don't think about it. The punter has to pull his you know hands up, grab that ball. Now he's out of where his base was. So as he tries to put that back, it's not so intuitive to find that spot very easily. You don't find mm. the spot as well. Now your kicker has 0.7 seconds to adjust to the spot being slightly left or slightly right, forward or back, or any other direction that you can see on a compass. So now he's got to adjust to that. He's got about 0.7 seconds. And in that time, he'll make whatever adjustments he needs, widen out where his plant foot is, plant a little closer, plant a little further back, do what he needs to do to, to try to get the ball to the uprights. Same thing with the, like the laces or if the punter misses his spot, or, you know, you feel a gust of wind blowing all of a sudden, now you've got to make those adjustments. So mechanically, there's just like a lot of little pieces that go into it. And everybody has to do their job. Like I said, really damn good. Like we just, we're really good at it. Like I don't want to undersell it. We're really good at it now, but you just feel it on those, you know, that, that 45 yarder where you see the punter come up for it. He brings it back down. The kicker, he hits it, it starts off straight and then just tails. Mm -hmm. There's a chance that that ball, when he brought it down, missed its spot inside by about an inch. And the huh. kicker towed it, and it just drifts, you know. And everything else is perfect. So it's like that, we're talking about margins of air here in the centimeters. And when you get even further back, like there's a famous Justin Tucker clip of him saying when he hit the 66-yarder, I believe, um, you have him talking about how he's just a system kicker, you know, like right. if everything else is set in place, the ball is going to go through. And obviously Justin Tucker is still the goat. Like he, yeah. he does incredible things with his leg and footballs that we haven't really seen before, but there's some truth to that statement in the sense of like, once everything else is there, if he, if he can get the, those two guys, the holder and the uh, long snapper, if he can get them in line, the chances of the ball going through are greatly increased when you have a good snap good hold and that's just across the board for anybody i, I want to ask you too before i gotta go uh ra meetings suck but um <laughs> is there a real difference between uh kicking or punting on turf compared to grass like I, it might sound like a stupid question it probably is i'll just be honest never been a kicker never <laughs> been a punter haven't played football since i was in like ever i was i've never played football <laughs> so you know that's fine um i would say so I've been a punter. I've never actually like kicked. From what I've heard, though, the di the differences are pretty minuscule for the most part. Uh, it's gonna affect like how you plant into the ball because the grass is a little bit softer, so you could plant a little harder and and get a little bit more explosive. Turf, you'll kind of bounce off of it more, so you can be right. a little lighter on your feet. Aside from that, I mean, it's you, you know you can hit more ground on turf. Because when you hit it on turf, your your foot's more likely to bounce off a little bit easier. While on grass, you're gonna like dig through it. And you're gonna lose a lot more. It's gonna drag and like just mm -hmm. catch a lot of grass. Um, but it, it's like minuscule stuff like that. So however your foot plays, I mean, if you're hitting ground on either, you're not doing great. Like you don't want to be hitting a lot of ground. So neither. I'm not saying either of them are gonna. The ball's gonna go in afterwards. But it's a right. it's a little different just how it feels and how how comfortable you can be doing it. So that's right. a little bit. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because there's yeah. a section of BBN that likes that makes that argument all the time. But uh, I gotta go. So Isaac, thanks for joining. I would love to have you on uh my podcast, Amateur Sports Scholars, whatever. Yeah, uh, love to have you on. Put you of on course. the spot. I know we're recording, so now you have to say yes. Right. But, uh, <laughs> no, just shoot me, shoot me a shoot me a text, uh, DM me on Instagram, whatever. All right, hell yeah. Uh, y'all take care. By the way, nice meeting. Right. You. Yeah, all right. See you. Sounds good. I'll take over for the podcast. Sadly, right. you know he's a freshman at UK, so he has right. the good old RA. Um, yeah. yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about special teams, but why is it so important for the kicker to have the ball, you know, with the laces out? Um, so there's a lot of theories. I think there's a famous, I don't know if famous is the right word, but there's a Pat McAfee clip where he made the claim. I'm not going to, I'm not trying to dispute it, but I've just never experienced this myself that when you hit the laces, it grips your foot a little bit more. So it's more likely to kind of pull to the left. Um, there's potentially some truth to that. Once again, I'm not here to dis disprove it. I think another part is psychological. Kickers, punters were very tuned in to spots on the ball. And laces, 
are going to immediately draw our attention. You'll, I, <laughs> I promise you, kickers won't be able to tell you the angle that you hold their ball at, no matter how bad you, unless it's really bad. Like, but whether it's like here or slightly turned in or slightly turned out, they probably won't be able to tell that you messed up a little bit. But as soon as they see a, a, a smidge of lace facing them, they will tell you every time. I think it's really big on the distraction part. So it just it, it catches their attention. Uh, I think that plays a psychological factor uh, into it. I know, so my last year at Pembroke, I had to hold lefty out of nowhere. Like I, I was holding for a righty. I, I was so ready for it. I was going to, I was going to hold the lights out. <laughs> then fall camp comes, righty can't play due to technical issues. And our backup was a lefty. And I was like, crap. <laughs> so our big thing was, I was like, look, I'm not as coordinated holding for lefty. Like, we'll figure it out as the season goes. But right now, I'm going to catch this ball. I'm going to place it in the spot. And you're just going to have to make it work. You know, like, <laughs> laces back, laces forward, laces to the side. Doesn't matter. We got to make those kicks. Like, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can. But if I try to spin it, because I'd have to hold it with my right hand and spin with my left. My left is uncoordinated. I'm going to knock it out. <laughs> so you're just going to have to go make it work. And he went uh, 10 for 11 that season. So... You know, I think you can find a way. I think you can find a way. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, it worked out. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit more about the special teams at Kentucky. Obviously, mm. Mark, um, Matt Ruffalo left along with Colin Goodfellow. They both graduated. They were, you know, six years uh, seniors, right. I believe. So they're both gone. Yeah, but um, but yeah, Kentucky this past offseason or this past year going into, they added two new kickers, a long snapper and a punter. How do you think the new additions will play into this upcoming year. Well, without having seen that, well, who's the new punter's name? I feel like I know the punter. Uh, is um, it Carter Schwartz? I don't think it's Carter Schwartz. Um, I'm blanking on his name. I that might, have... He might be at a different school. I'm thinking of like Alex Raymer, maybe. I'm I'm blanking on his name right now. Okay, okay. let me see where I thought. I thought my boy Carter was there. Maybe. Or right, we're both looking it up right, right now. We're both looking it up right now. No, yeah. where's he committed to? No, this is the guy going to Louisville. Who am I thinking? No, I know there's another guy that that I messaged a lot that is now at um Kentucky. Uh I know we had Wilson Berry this past year too. Um, yep. I, I've kept up with Wilson. He's a he's an Aussie too, right? Yeah, Wilson yep. Berry is an Aussie. Yeah. Trying to see if I can find it. Let's see. Right. Okay. I'm going to the roster right now. Let's see who gets it first. We've got Chance Poor. Um, let's see. Alex Rayner. Uh -huh. Speaking about earlier. Um, let's see. Who else do we have on this list? Jackson Moore. Uh, Jackson Moore. No, that's not the guy I'm thinking of. Michael Bernard. <laughs> no. Gosh, Jackson... You guys have you have that many punters on roster right now? <laughs> I'm naming punters and kickers. Oh, right. okay. I, was, I thought you were just naming punters. I was like, oh my no. gosh, we got I'm so many. Jackson Smith as well. Um, Smith. And then we've got long snappers, Ronald Gaines, uh, Clay Perry, long snapper, Walker, him. Heath. Bob. I'm thinking of Heath Jehu. That's who I'm thinking of. He's, he's the their newest punter. He's mm -hmm. a freshman that they just brought in. So Heath Jehu and Wilson Berry are the two punters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heath, I know Heath. Heath, if you're watching this, what's up, my guy? Hope you're doing well. <laughs> Hope fall camp went well for you. I've been keeping up with some of your kicks. Okay. Anyway, sorry. That's on me. I, I forgot that's this guy's name. Um anyway, competition is always good. That's <laughs> all that just to say, competition is always good. I mean, if they're bringing in, they've got two seniors. Wait, three seniors? one, two, yeah, two seniors, uh, a redshirt freshman and a freshman. There's like all you need twenty five percent chance one of those guys is good, right? Like 25. if the coach, <laughs> the if the coaches can find out, you only need one good one. Mm -hmm. And then Heath, I know Heath can kick. Uh, like I know he can punt. Wilson Barry's a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Um, that's their the, the Aussie Aussies can always punt. Kangaroo Jack MFers, right? Like those guys can freaking boot. <laughs> I love me some good Aussie punters. Um, so like they'll one of those two will find a way. I know a lot of the um. A lot of college coaches recently have been doing like the one-two punt punch, where you've got the 
Aussie punter as like the short field midfield kind of guy. And then your American punter who hits the spiral cleaner, typically on average, um, they'll have him hit the long field punts and they have the Aussie hit short field punts. Or if they're bringing a lot of pressure, they'll have the Aussie because they can handle pressure well and roll out and hit the ball across the field. So I, I would have to imagine it looks like he's got a lot of tools at his disposal. I'm sure all these guys are pretty solid. I mean, they're there. They're probably yeah. solid. So they'll, they'll figure it out. Yeah, figure it out. They have hopefully. To. And yeah. hopefully, you know, UK will have a better special teams uh, this upcoming year, obviously. Yeah. Last year, long snap and mistakes. Uh, went over went over Colin Goodfellow's head, a poor right. flat play. And then obviously field goal. I think UK went 16 for 24 this past year on field goal attempts, not extra points. But yeah, yeah, it's pretty tough. Pretty tough, 16 for 24. But, you know, hopefully you kind of just have to believe that they'll get it figured out. It's always so hard to say because you figure out this kind of stuff in the off season. So we'll we'll find out on Saturdays, you know, if these guys have been working hard to improve on their crafts and uh, if the coaches have come up with good schemes to put them in good positions, nice clean pockets to punt out of, good protection to kick from and have them operating under amount of time that's going to keep them efficient and clean without putting too much stress on themselves to get it off too fast. Yeah. Yeah, I know the Cincinnati Bengals also struggled at the very beginning of the year last year against the Steelers as well. So yep. can't forget about yep. that. <laughs> if you're a Bengals fan. Yes, they did struggle a bit against the Steelers last year. So but you know, we the Bengals, we got some we got some we got some guys out there now. So between yeah brad robbins and nevin mcpherson and you know our long snapping situation's always been good i think now we got caladomitis so yeah we should be all right we got a very young core of specialists that should be riding with the Bengals for a long time and i'm feel i feel good about the Bengals special team situation so if i'm feeling good about it yeah. that should speak wonders to other Bengals fans out yeah. there who did yeah, I hear you. and hopefully joe burrow will be fully healthy come season time if you're a Bengals fan obviously this is a kentucky sports podcast but <laughs> obviously most UK fans are also Cincinnati Bengals fans, so got yeah. something common as well. <laughs> right. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate you joining the podcast. I'll definitely leave your YouTube channel in the description as well, so y'all can obviously watch his YouTube videos. I watch it all the time. He uh, posts great content, Isaac Parks or Isaac Punts on YouTube. So thank you again for coming on to this podcast. All right. No, thank you for having me, and I look forward to coming back to talk more special teams whenever. Ooh, let's do it then. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all again for watching.